T-Rex. This is the superstar of the dinosaurs. Six tons of pure predator. And it's not just a big carnivore, it's also big business. Not long ago, the scientific community was all abuzz about the discovery of the most complete T-Rex skeleton ever found. And to no one's surprise, everyone wanted it. They're meat-eating marauders. Among the biggest, baddest carnivores that ever walked the earth. Animals 40 feet long, more than 13 feet tall, armed with steak knives for teeth. The Tyrannosaurus Rex is the quintessential jaws of death. And an enduring mystery, since no complete skeletons have ever been unearthed. Now, a remarkable discovery is helping reveal secrets that have been buried for 67 million years. It's not just a once in a lifetime discovery, it's a once in a hundred lifetime discovery, or I don't know, thousands of lives. You know, it's like I never could have dreamed of finding something so spectacular. Sixty-five million years ago, a giant asteroid crashed into Earth, wreaking environmental havoc that some scientists believe killed off the dinosaurs. But asteroid or not, one thing's for sure, the world of Tyrannosaurus Rex came to a definite end. Until now. One T-Rex is about to travel through time and embark on an incredible adventure. August 12th, 1990. A sweltering day in the South Dakota Badlands. Sue Hendrickson, a field paleontologist for the Black Hills Institute, is about to stumble on the discovery of a lifetime. There was this one small area I hadn't been looked at. It was constantly on my mind. Every night I'd say, oh, geez, you know, I didn't get over there. We really need to get over there. I needed to go and look at that one place. And it's really, really strange to be pulled like that. Sue has an uncanny knack for finding things. And something seems to be drawing her closer. She actually called me, like, and it's no rational explanation for it. When she spots some bone fragments along the base of a cliff, she senses an extraordinary possibility. I looked up the hill, and about seven, eight feet up, there was uh, quite a few bones, so then I crawled up the, beside it to, to look closer, and there were three vertebrae in a row and there was a rib sticking out. Sue shares her find with Peter Larson, head of the Black Hills Institute. Well, immediately I asked Susan, you know, is there more of it? And she said, there's lots more. And so we ran over the two miles to the, to the, to the site, and, and there coming out of the hill, about seven feet up, was this huge cross-section of bones. And I knew at that point that the whole thing was gonna be there. The idea is that I believe that the tail's going that way and the skull is going this way. But we're just gonna have to dig it up and see. It was so, I don't know, the, the exact word isn't even really in the language. It was not, it was way beyond exciting. It was, it was just like climbing to Mount Everest and, and being at the top and looking around. When I found her and then while you're digging her, you know, it's like, wow, I'm the first person to see her in 67 million years. I really felt like she was meant to be found. The new discovery is quickly dubbed Sue the T-Rex in honor of Susan Hendrickson. The team begins the arduous task of separating Sue from the sandstone cliff. As they peel away layer after layer of earth and rock, 
her massive skeleton slowly begins to reveal itself. Bone by magnificent bone. And as we excavated her, especially after we exposed more bones and we realized how complete she was, you talk to her, you feel like she's alive and that she's been waiting. You're uncovering her. It's like you're, you're revealing her. You're bringing her back to life. Within 17 days, she's excavated and carefully wrapped in plaster jackets for transport back to the lab in Hill City. For 18 months, lab technicians at the Black Hills Institute meticulously prepare Sue for exhibition. She's the largest, most complete T-Rex ever found. And she's to be the centerpiece of their new museum, the magnet that will attract tourists from all over the world. But it's not meant to be. On May 14, 1992, the Institute's plans go awry. FBI and other federal agents launch a dramatic raid of the lab and seize the giant T-Rex. They load all 10 tons of her onto trucks and haul Sue away to Rapid City. When the FBI came and took Sue, it was probably one of the lowest points in my life. Um, not only the accusations, but also losing this friend you know, Sue, the T-Rex, had, had become a living entity to us. Sue, the T-Rex, is put in protective custody, where she'll sit under lock and key for years, buried again. She's about to discover the world of lawyers. It turns out Sue, the T-Rex, was found on property ranched by Morris Williams, a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Williams' land was held in trust by the federal government. The Black Hills Institute thought it had bought the rights to sue for $5,000, but Williams denies ever agreeing to sell his claim to the dinosaur. A flurry of litigation follows. Everybody wants a piece of Sue. In the end, after an 18-month custody battle, a federal court decides that Sue belongs to Morris Williams and the U.S. government. I had no knowledge of it, what uh, dinosaurs were and, and their value. <clears throat> but the federal government was very insistent that I sell it, and so it went that way. Williams' agreement to sell catapulted Sue from the jailhouse to the auction house. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Sotheby's. We have for auction today the fossil of a Tyrannosaurus Rex known as Sue. $1 million debiting at $1 million, $2.3 million debiting $2.3 At $2 million and counting, Sue is on her way to becoming the most expensive dinosaur of all time. In two places, 3.4 is standing. 5.7, 5.8, 5.9. And the bids keep rising. 7 million, 7.5. 7 million, 6. Fair warning then, it's 7 million, 600,000. Up here. 7 million, 600,000. When the bidding ends and Sotheby's commission is added, Sue sells for a record $8.36 million to Chicago's world-renowned Field Museum of Natural History. And she hits the road again. It's 800 miles to Sue's new home in Chicago, and the Field Museum has big plans for her public debut. <laughs> to get her ready for opening night, Paleontologist Bill Simpson and his team begin restoring Sue at their new state-of-the-art dino lab. After more than seven years, she'll finally be liberated from her blanket of rock. The challenge is to remove millions of years of stone without breaking any of Sue's bones. Using highly specialized tools, 
the team delicately strips away most of the unwanted rock. It's a painstaking process that will take nearly two years to complete. A kind of sandblaster shoots out baking soda to remove the final layer of rock and reveal Sue's chocolate brown bones. Amazing. It's an amazing transformation. That's half the fun of all this, is taking an object which looks, you know, not all that great to start with and just make it look like a million bucks. Or in this case, eight million. God, it's just so huge. It's just ridiculous. You could stick a person in there. I want to say it makes you, you know, more closely appreciate why you don't want to see one alive. Paleontologist Chris Brochu is responsible for writing Sue's biography her definitive description for the museum exhibition. One of the first things that catches his interest is Sue's brain. Sue's brain was about uh, one foot in length and uh, about, this, about the general shape of a very large sweet potato. Okay, it was about the size of a great big yam. It still blows my mind to look at a skull this big attached to a skeleton as big as this was and this is the brain. That's still something I have a hard time getting over. In other words, Sue's big on body, small on brain. But her skull holds a treasure trove of information. And the only way to unlock it, short of chopping the skull in half, is with a giant CT scan in Los Angeles. The Field Museum has to get Sue ready for delivery. You're only protected when you have the suits on, the, the hoods on, the air going. In order to transport and scan her without damaging the goods, Sue's skull has to be wrapped in foil and sprayed with a toxic foam. This is no simple task. The foam must hold the fragile skull firmly in place when it's rotated and scanned. The skull weighs a little less than a ton, but these bones are one or two millimeters thick. It's literally built like a one-ton chocolate Easter rabbit. Okay, hollow but very heavy. Her skull is morphed into an enormous nerf-like tyrannosaur. That's good. A custom-made crate fits neatly around her foam skull, and every possible precaution is taken. Her next stop is California, and she's hitched a ride with this driver before. I picked up Sue at New York, in New York at the auction house. Took her to the Field Museum in Chicago. Six months later, I picked her up in the Field Museum and took her out to Disneyland in Florida. And then they told me to come back to Chicago to pick her back up to take her to California because they want to x-ray the skull. It's the most expensive thing I ever moved before, and 8.6 million is a lot to be hauling around from the East Coast to the West Coast. I'll make sure I take good care of her. It's 2,000 miles to the city of starlets and dreamers. Dinosaurs have been Hollywood's darlings for decades. Dinosaurs! They starred in some of the earliest silent movies and have been box office hits ever since. Professor, there's a big lizard back there and he's heading this way. Now get aboard! People just can't seem to get enough of them. Movies. Merchandise. She makes it to L.A. without a scratch. And enters the Twilight Zone. She's ready for her close-ups, and this machine can see through wooden crates. 
Boeing's industrial CT scanner usually scans space shuttle engines. It's 25 times more powerful than CAT scans used on humans. If Sue were a person, she'd be toast under the high-powered x-rays. As it is, no one is quite sure what to expect. This is the first time a T-Rex has ever been x-rayed with an industrial high-resolution scanner. When they first started shooting x-rays through it, and I was thinking it would be a real tragedy if all we got was a gray smudge and no details. But their fears are soon put to rest. The CT slices will allow Chris to look inside Sue's brain case and see the details of her ears and nasal passages. The results are far more than I could have expected. The image quality is fantastic. Uh, we're going to learn more about this animal than we could have possibly learned without it. The images are already unraveling some of the mysteries of Sue's daily life. From a professional standpoint, these are a gold mine. The most interesting conclusion I've made is Tyrannosaurus rex and its closest relatives were very much driven by their sense of smell. They probably saw very well, they probably heard very well, uh, but their sense of smell, I, I think, given how the brain was put together, was given primacy. It was really emphasized. These animals smelled their way through life. Some scientists argue that tyrannosaurs were scavengers, based on this evidence. I don't think we can really answer, was it a predator or a scavenger, to, with, with any precision. But if these things were like other living, meat-eating animals, the answer is probably yes. Most meat-eating animals today will predate or scavenge as the circumstances arise. The potential for new information is staggering. There's no such thing as being done with a fossil. Surely somebody 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now is going to come back here, see something I missed, or have some new tool that they can apply to this thing that I, wouldn't, I can't even dream of and find something that, that we wouldn't have even thought was there. Over the next year, as Sue's enormous body is pieced back together, Chris and others will try to solve some of the unanswered questions. How did she move? Who were her closest relatives? Was she warm-blooded or cold-blooded? And is she really a female? Sue's adventure continues to go where no dinosaur has gone before by taking paleontology to the brink of extraordinary new insights into Tyrannosaurus rex. For Sue Hendrickson, the woman who started it all, it's been a long, strange trip. She hasn't made a cent off her T-Rex or become a sought-after celebrity, but that doesn't seem to matter. I feel very responsible for her. I don't know why I found her. I don't know why it was me, but it was. And, and I'm very concerned about where she is and how she's being cared for. And, and she's in a good place now and being loved as she needs to be. And if Sue can be an icon to inspire people to learn, I think that's what she's for. I think that's why she was meant to be found.